Hello gamers. It's been a while since the last video, hasn't it? Well, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but this is going to be the last Traitor Town video I ever upload on this channel. I'm not going to get into the details right now, but we've got a map update to cover. And Archipelago 2.3 is easily the second largest update since the remake of this map way back for 2.0. Now this update consists of three main parts. Optimization, decoration, and a million tiny gameplay tweaks across the entire map. Don't worry, the layout hasn't been changed. There are no new caves or anything like that, but certain parkour jumps have been buffed, certain prop jump spots have been patched out, I'm afraid. The version of Archipelago that you guys have been playing for the past year is 2.2. And you might remember, I never actually uploaded a video about 2.2, despite it being quite a large update. The reason why is, well, quite simply, Making videos takes a long time. Archipelago has gone through four major updates. The first being the original creation back in Christmas of 2020, which means that the map is nearly three years old now. What the hell? And then the other updates came out a bit later. 2.0 being a layout rework coming out about five months later, then 2.1 just being a real quick day long bug fix. But 2.2 came out around the 6th of November, 2021 which puts it to be nearly two years old. And that is the version of the map that all of you people remember. Now 2.2 was a massive update. It took me a month and 10 days, longer than it took to make the original layout for the map, and was a massive optimization update. When making Archipelago, I didn't know anything about how to make maps run well, nor did I know how to use Blender. So when making objects such as the trees, I would just go into Roblox Studio, grab a cone mesh from the toolbox and just use it everywhere. And that fulfilled my purposes quite well. But as it turns out, this was a mistake. To explain it simply, every object in the game is made up of triangles or tries as I'm going to be calling them. This isn't something that's unique to my map. This is something that is done in every single 3D video game that you have played. From Ocarina of Time to Doom Eternal, Every game's maps, walls, monsters, gun models, whatever it might be, are made up of hundreds to thousands of tiny little triangles that make up the geometry of a shape. Apparently it's easy to work with in terms of game development, but the basic gist is, if your camera is pointing towards an object in a video game engine, the engine needs to know to render it. Now what the engine does is it will take a look all of the triangles that are in front of your camera. And then it will start rendering them one by one, going through the entire list until eventually a frame is created out of all of the information that's available to the game engine. Triangles that are behind or further away from the player get rendered first. And then the triangles that are closer to the camera get rendered last. This creates the sort of 3D effect that you know from every single game. However, the triangles behind are still rendered. Now some games do hide these back triangles using some clever math, but the problem is Roblox doesn't have that feature. Fun fact, if you actually zoom in on this fire extinguisher, you can see the actual jagged edges of all the polygons that make up this model. You physically can't simulate roundness in a video game. But overall, if you look very closely, you'll notice that every single model in every single video game that is trying to look round, just has a jagged outline, while the actual surface itself is cleverly smooth shaded to look not flat. Now rendering triangles takes up computing power. Back in 1996, Super Mario 64 came out and that game uses triangles very obviously. You can actually just see them. And the reason why is back then the Nintendo 64 couldn't handle too many objects on the screen. So what they did, was they just use as little triangles as possible to try and squeeze as much performance out of the little hardware that they had. You may even notice that as Mario gets further away from the screen, his polygons actually decreases suddenly as he changes out for a lower detail model. And this is just to save performance. Anyways, Roblox does the same thing. Every part that you see in game is actually made up of 12 triangles. Two triangles to make up the squares of each face and then six sets of two around each side to create a cube. And then obviously you can stretch, squash, and widen the part to any length you want. 
And all that does is cause the triangles making up that cube to just move their vertices further and further apart, giving to the illusion that this box is being made larger. Get a color, throw a texture on it, and bam, you've got yourselves the gritty hallways of Station 27. Every single object that you see in Roblox is made up of triangles. Triangles are as fundamental to video games as the atom is to human life. Take a look at Archipelago 1.0. Go to the top of your studio bar, click View, then click wireframe. You can now see all of the triangles that make up your map. Try it with yours. If you fly around for a bit though, you may notice something off about the trees. Let me get closer. Oh God, what is that? Basically, this tree is made up of a basic cone mesh that I took for free off of the Roblox toolbox. Some random person created this cone, gave it to the world for free and caused me problems because this cone is 556 tries. You see this line running through the middle of it? That is a loop cut. What that means is that this cone has effectively got almost double the triangles it would have if you just didn't loop cut the middle of the cone. If I drag it into Blender, delete the loop cut and import it back into Studio, see if you can spot the difference between the two cones. You can't. There is physically no difference between these two cones. The only difference is that the game engine has to spend a little bit more time rendering all those extra triangles that you can't see in the first place. And that cone is one of 310 cones. 310 times 556 tries is 172,360 triangles. If I remove the loop cut, and just join the bottom vertices to the top ones, the cone drops from 556 tries all the way down to 366 tries. So by making a simple change that has no visual difference in game at all, we go from 172,360 tries down to 113,000. That's 58,000 tries saved from one mesh. There are other meshes everywhere on Arc. You can start to see the optimization problems now, can't you? <laughs> and if that number doesn't already scare you, do you want to know how many tries make up the entirety of Mesa Monorail? 87,000. Yeah, Mesa Monorail is only a little bit more triangles than the amount of triangles used in a single cone mesh that you physically can't see. That you can't see them, they're pointless. Okay, taking a step back here, how many triangles do you think Archipelago 2.0 had total? 1,335,000. You could fit 15 Mesa monorails onto this map. So I had to do something about this and it required learning Blender. And I'm just gonna say this, learning Blender is a fucking nightmare. My brother behind the camera is nodding his head right now because it's true. Oh my God, the amount of Googling I had to do just to answer the most basic questions. Huge thanks to every single person in the community that helped me out learn how to use this software and taught me all of the basics. A few months after 2.1 had been out, I started working on 2.2, which was all about optimization. And you may recognize 2.2 with its signature cave. Yeah, this cave wasn't in 2.0 or 2.1. It's all 2.2. That's the only gameplay change I've made since 2.0, really. Hero is Band 2 is a member of the community that some of you may already know. And his computer is not the best. So years ago, he'd constantly tell me that Archipelago is too laggy for him to play. He was getting on average 25 FPS. After 2.2 came out though, his frame rate doubled to 50 FPS. How many tries did I manage to scrape out of 2.2? Version 1.0 has 1.213 million triangles. Version 2.0 and 2.1, which like I said, are basically identical, sit at an all-time high of 1.335 million triangles. 2.2 though? 576,000. Compared to other maps, this puts it in 15th place out of the 26 maps we have today. So instead of being the third laggiest, it is now the 11th laggiest. Good job. And I'd like to mention that 
diabetes sits at the whopping 1.8 million triangles, 500,000 more than Arc 2.1, and is no longer able to be voted in the map pool for this very reason. It is just too laggy. The second worst map, Water Hazard, recently got an optimization update from my good homie, Zooks, or Clockwoods, you might know of him, and he managed to chop the map in half, all the way down to 533,000 triangles, which is actually more optimized than 2.2. So, with all of that introduction out of the way, how many triangles did I manage to save for this newest update, 2.3? If we compare it to the all-time high of 2.0 and 2.1, I managed to save 1,144,000 triangles. Archipelago is now the fourth most optimized map in the game, right below Mesa Monorail, Compound, and Anubis. A map created by Hero is Banned, the very laggy player I just mentioned, who very obviously created that map optimized to begin with, because if he didn't, he wouldn't be able to open it. This optimization update has taken me two months and 12 days of hard work, making it the second most time I've spent on any update since the original 2.0 remake that started this whole optimization nightmare in the first place. But this update isn't all optimization. It's time to talk about the decoration changes. So the first change you'll immediately notice is that boat room has been completely revamped. As you can see here, I've created a new boat that overhangs the level. And no, it's not a tea trap. Overall, the biggest changes that this map has received is Cliffside turning blue. You'll also recognize that this room has had a Triforce added. I'll be getting to that later, but you'll also notice the chandelier being much more optimized. The Gamer Dungeon has received a bit of a facelift too, with these new blue brick tilings used everywhere. And another major feature of 2.3 is that I have reworked every single weapon spawn, so you'll notice a lot of these shelves being a lot less disorganized than before. That shotgun's not meant to be on the floor, I need to fix that. I've also added three new locked doors around the map, just to give the sense that there's more to this map than what's in the playable space. You'll notice that both the elevator and that door back there have been changed over from cylinders to squares. I'm actually really proud of the optimized dumpster model that I've created. It's several hundred more tries more optimized, and yet it looks better because I've fixed the shading problems. You'll also notice that the wind everywhere has been quietened just a little bit. You may also notice that grenades across the entire map have been moved into more just accessible locations, including smokes and discombobulators. That chopping board is now a prop. And here's a close-up of the radio. If you actually look very closely, you can see the more optimized model have physically less tries. Most people won't even realize that it's been optimized another shelf that's been reorganized. I've also added more explosive barrels in mid, just to make it interesting for traders to clear out. Mid in general has also had a facelift. These new grates just explain where the water goes. Mid has also received a lot of these new lights, just to brighten up the area a little bit more. I've also lowered this platform to make uh, sniping a little bit less oppressive than before. Now the changes to the ocean are probably the most noticeable. I've saved 70,000 triangles by changing it into this texture. And personally, I think it looks better. The only downside is that bodies no longer float in the water. They just kind of awkwardly slide into the ocean floor. Now Villa got a huge facelift this update. That cave has always been there, but now you can see into it with this window. 
that window being inspired by a little in Dublin that was built upon the foundations of an old Viking house. And so they installed a window in the floor to show people a piece of history. Also, the terrain and lighting have been tweaked a lot. And also I've changed the fog out for an atmosphere and added some sun rays too. Remember the Triforce I mentioned in that other room? It used to be in Villa. If I change the map over, you can actually see it fall under the map because I actually forgot to anchor it and I made it can collide false. That Triforce has always been in the map, yet in 2.2, I accidentally unanchored it. So yeah. If you look at those ridges on the far right wall, you can see that I've removed the middle one, turning that into a much tougher parkour jump. I think it's a lot more fun to do now. Give it a try. Overall, I am actually quite happy with the changes I've made to Villa. I believe the entire place looks a lot better than it did before. This room hasn't had much added, but I thought I'd show it just for complete clarity. You'll also notice that all the terrain in every cave has been smoothed out incredibly. This makes locomotion upon parts of the map so much easier than before. Overall, the map itself, whilst looking a little bit darker, just feels a lot more complete. It feels a lot more pleasant and less straining on the eyes. This next section, I'm just going to be quickly showing you the changes between old and new props that I've optimized. I'm not showing you every prop, but you'll notice that the wireframes are dramatically less triangle dense than before. And some props literally don't even have any changes whatsoever, like that box. This chair's feet has been flattened and any round surfaces have been removed because round surfaces create a lot of extra tries. As for this barrel, I kind of want to redo it to be a bit more detailed, but that's something for later. The same applies to this propane canister. I think I oversimplified it a bit too much. And I even optimized the ammo for every single map in the game. Anytime you try to load up ammo in your map, it will be replaced with these models, which is far more optimized and can save around 5,000 to 10,000 tries for every single map in the game. Now this video is starting to get a little bit long, so I wanna do this next section as a bit of a lightning round. Since I don't plan on making any more videos, I'm gonna cover a bunch of map making tips, tricks and things to watch out for and as general advice for other map makers. So if you don't make maps, then skip past this bit because it's not for you. The first thing I wanna cover is weapon spawns. I noticed that it can be quite frustrating for a player to spawn in, grab a gun and then have no ammo nearby. It can be even more annoying to have three shotgun shells next to an SMG. The problem with this is that it's quite unoptimized to leave just random pieces of ammo lying near weapons that don't actually use them. So if you're going to be placing weapons around, you should at the very least place two pieces of ammo next to them. I'd also like to point out that good grenade placement is just as important as well. For example, Archipelago, I have opted to put more discombobulators at the cliffside portion of the map and more incendiaries at mid. There is an even spread, of course, but the areas of the map that do require certain kinds of grenades get a few more than the others. And this is because you're more likely to use a discombob at cliffside to throw people off the edge. It's basic stuff like this that makes learning certain weapon spawns much easier. Pistol placement is just as important too. I think it's interesting to put the more powerful deagle in spots that are harder to reach, but more rewarding for players to get to. So you gotta find a little bit of a balance. Do you opt to have all of your weapons laid out in a big room for everybody to reach? Or do you make it really awkward in the other end of the spectrum and make it hard to get the actual ammo for the weapon you want? You wanna avoid something like Mesa Monorail where you're forced to ammo waste certain pistols just to get a full stack. Because this means that there are multiple pistols in this room that are effectively useless to anybody who runs by to grab a gun for the start of the game. For 2.2 on Ark, you may notice that a lot of the weapon spawns look quite messy. But in 2.3, there are no ammo boxes that are too far away from their respective gun. You'll also notice that I do incorporate the big shelf idea that certain maps like Station 27 and Mars Wastelands use. But I don't overdo it like those maps do. There are only a few spots on the map that have these large pools of weapons and they're 
really only used as a reserve. You don't necessarily always come to these places every single round. I think a problem with a map like 67th Way is that everybody clamors to get to gun store because that's where all the guns are. But if you really think about it, it means that every single round starts off being more heavily weighted towards gun store engagements. However, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just something to keep in mind. For example, if there are areas of the map that you would rather people go to, then it makes sense to put large caches of weapons there. I've put large caches of weapons in the more secretive parts of the map because it means that if you can't get a weapon in the more obvious spots where people normally do spawn and grab a gun quickly, you can quickly book it to these more out of the way spots of the map to grab a gun that you actually do need. You recognize these two doors, right? Well, if I turn on collision view, you might be surprised to notice something wrong about the door with the slot in it. Yeah, the collision of this door is a diamond. Have you ever tried to shoot somebody through the slits in these doors? Yeah, the reason why your shots sometimes get blocked is because the collision hasn't been set to precise convex decomposition. After doing that, I fixed the collision and now you can actually shoot through these corners. This is a problem that plagues a lot of maps and is the reason why a lot of maps feel very awkward to play. A prime example being the windows on Santa Fe or these corner pillars on Vista Overpass. Now that doesn't mean you should use precise convex decomposition for everything, because this can be quite costly on your computer. Keep in mind that you may be familiar with crouch jumping on the handles of doors. So if you've been doing that ever for parkour reasons to get on top of the door, it's a bit harder to do with precise convex decomposition enabled. So for many normal doors, I keep them as default so that the behavior with the handle is to be expected. But with doors that have holes in them, such as the asylum doors, I've opted to make them precise convex decomposition just so that no bullets get erroneously blocked by invisible pieces of geometry that you can't actually see in game. Here's another example of what bad collision can do to a model. Take this chandelier. If I set this to a box collision, you can now stand in midair on the corners and it will block bullets. Default is pretty accurate, but you can still see that it can be quite chunky in many places. Hull is also a pretty good thing to use, but only for objects that aren't hollow and don't have indents. I personally use hull collision for stuff like this hexagon model, because default collision is a lot more costly than hull collision. And lastly, you may notice that these chains that I've used have box collision, but they're chains and they have holes in them. So wouldn't that block a lot of bullets? Well, if I turn on collision view again, yes, I've turned these chains into boxes, but that doesn't matter because what I've gone and done is I've put them in the bounds folder. By putting these into bounds, it means that you can shoot through them, but you can still collide with them. Every invisible wall in the game uses the bounds folder because it allows people to shoot through the bound, but not be able to walk through it. You'll notice that a lot of things actually have box collision enabled. For example, the leaves and all the trees have box collision enabled, and all of the bushes do too. All of these leaves, bushes, and anything that I don't expect the player to collide with is put within the bounds folder, so you can shoot through it whether you're inside it or not. Another thing that I put in the bounds folder are these drapes. And the reason why I've implemented these drapes in Archipelago, there are a lot of maps such as Station 27 that just randomly block bullets. That's why I chose to make these drapes block your view, but not block your bullets. Because it means that a player that plays on my map and sees a player on the other side and shoots through it, realizes, oh, I can actually shoot through that. These chairs and many other basic props use the default collision simply because it means that sitting in them is a lot more consistent. Go down to the custom physical properties and crank up the density. By doing this, this chair stays still much more consistently than if you try to jump onto a chair normally and it pings away from you. Fiddle around with the custom physical properties of props in your map and it might allow you to create more consistent props. One piece of advice I have is to make your floors extra thick and make your walls extra thick when you can. This prevents players from clipping underneath your map. I have even used invisible bounds in certain areas of the map, since there's a bit of terrain here that people could reach if they punched themselves through the floor, but I couldn't make the floor thicker itself because if I try to, it just sticks through the floor. So I used some invisible bounds that are wedges to prevent people from clipping through the floor here. Another important aspect of map design that I'd like to talk about are sound effects. I think having just any kind of ambient sound effect makes your map so much more interesting to play. 
However, another aspect of sound effects that I'd like to point out that is a lot more important than just ambient sound effects is footstep sound effects. You may notice that all throughout Ark, I've actually very carefully chosen what materials to use in what places. For example, you notice how this cave is mostly grass all the way up until the turning point to Villa? This means that if somebody is standing, let's say here, and they hear grass footsteps coming from there, if they keep hearing grass footsteps, then they know that that's because they're heading up towards platform. However, if the grass footsteps suddenly turn to concrete, they know that they've taken the turning heading down to this door and they should get ready for a fight. You can always hear where left or right sound effects are coming from, but not where up or down sound effects are coming from. I think Cross Isle PD is a prime example of this actually, because it can be very often hard to tell if somebody's in the room next to you, next to you but above, or next to you but below. I personally think that Cross Isle PD would be greatly improved if every floor was changed to be a different material. For example, the ground floor should be all stone or marble. The middle floor should be all wood, even in the offices. And then the top floor should be all carpet. I think doing this will make navigating the map and hearing where other players are much, much easier. And Archipelago already applies this concept. For example, this platform isn't necessarily just a purely aesthetic choice, it was actually a gameplay choice. I very specifically gave it an incredibly loud metal grate material override so that anybody at Villa can immediately know that there's somebody in the sniper spot. That sort of early warning sign not only makes a map much easier to navigate and track people through, but it also incentivizes traitors to be a bit more sneaky and to go slower. I actually chose to make this whole area watery for three main reasons. One, it means that the waterfalls can create a really loud sound effect. This obfuscates footsteps in the surrounding areas, meaning that large groups of innocents chilling at mid, despite technically hearing the most amount of the map and having the most knowledge surrounding them, by making an extremely loud waterfall sound effect next to mid, nerfing the supposed group camping power of this central area. The second nerf is that it's watery. So, if you're anywhere else but mid, and you're trying to track down somebody and they take the quickest path through to the next area, which is usually mid, you will be able to hear it. And this allows you to narrow down where they are much more quickly. And then the third reason is you can plant C4 down here and it's really hard to tell. So that's another nerf to mid that hopefully, combined with the fact that there are a few props nearby for the poltergeist, plus explosive barrels in case you want to get really crazy, I have put a lot of effort into trying to make sure that mid is only really used as a quick access point to other areas of the map and not a central area for players to congregate and group camp. Because group camping is a problem I think with a lot of maps, such as Skeld or Station 27, and I don't want it to happen on my map. It can still happen, but there are plenty of options for traders to deal with them. But this is the level of thought that I put into every single area of this map. And it's thought that I wish more map makers would put into theirs. Another thing that I've done is actually move hotel further away. The reason why is because I noticed that on graphics one, the hotel loaded in, but only part way. And I personally wouldn't want people to load in unnecessary out of bound areas at graphics one because the people who are playing on Graphics 1 are trying their best to run the game as best as possible. So I moved the hotel further away so it doesn't render in at all. As for these distant islands, you may notice that an optimizing thing that I did for them is I just made them flat. All I did was I deleted the ocean, took a screenshot of these terrain blobs as up close as I could get them so they were in their high detail state, and then I manually rotoscoped around them and imported them as a PNG, gave a mesh brick a surface appearance, set the alpha mode to transparency, Put the PNG into Roblox asset ID of the color map and bam, you've got yourself free terrain. The only disadvantage is that it pisses off Lewis 5 d because he keeps pointing out how they look low resolution, but he should cope. He, he should cope, he should shut up, uh, he should really sh Another thing that's important for maps to have is fun factor. I've noticed something that happened to 2.3 playtesters. Normally when people play Ark, they like to play around this watery area at mid. However, when adding this new bar to Villa, 
all of a sudden everybody wanted to play around this area. And I realized something. When making a map, if you want people to gravitate towards a certain area, an easy way to do that is to create a fun room for people to hang out in. People like to roleplay casually while they wait for the traders to come murder them. So adding a kitchen or a bar or a snooker room can really drag more attention to your map. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily have any true gameplay changes, but I honestly think it does. Not only do people remember it better and more fondly in a casual sense, but in a competitive sense, it dictates where a large chunk of the innocents go. So if you want an area of the map to be more patrolled than the rest, because you think it allows for far more fun and interesting engagements, then it makes sense to have your more interesting parts of the map have more fun areas because you're more likely to have innocents to congregate in areas where the traders are more likely to have fun slaughtering them. Another thing I'd like to point out is that out of bounds secrets can make a map so much more memorable. Cave did used to be a playable area. It used to lead all the way to hotel, but I removed it because, well, it just, we don't have hotel anymore. But I kept this remnant of the cave because it just gives a bit more narrative meat to the bones of Archipelago. Where does this door lead? What does this button do behind this metal grate? Why doesn't the elevator work? All of these are just stuff that people keep coming back for. And if you want to reward people for exploring your map in further detail, then just hide a few Easter eggs here and there. I'm not going to show you my Easter eggs though, they're mine. They're secret, you can't see them. And lastly, one piece of map design that I'd like to talk about is that a good map that's balanced for both the innocents and traders is a map that makes you feel on edge. I dislike Skeld. And the reason why is it's super easy to walk into a room as an innocent and immediately know everything that's going on. If I walk into cafeteria, I can see absolutely every person that's in that room. Quickly scan through them, catch all their names, and I know everything that's going on in that room. I don't have to worry about checking behind any boxes or clearing any extra angles, because there's no cover for people to hide around the corners of, there's no places for people to be sneaky, and other than the vent itself, there is no real surprises that people can use to jump scare me with. Scaled also has a problem in that the doors close automatically, and this is actually a problem because it means that you can always trust that the doors will always be closed, meaning all you have to do is stand somewhere and listen out. And the second you hear a door open in an area where there's not supposed to be any people, you can deduct quite a lot of information from that. For example, let's say you're a detective and you're playing Skeld and you see two radar points on the left-hand side of the map. If, after a while, one of those radar points disappears and then the door on the left-hand side suddenly opens, well, you know who the traitor is because he didn't reveal the corpse, you know that there's a radar point missing, and so you should just shoot this guy. And that's the level of just informational power that a lot of maps like Station 27, Skeld, Hafen, even Terminal, just all have. These maps are bad because you can just chill in one area and have all of the information available to you. A good map is one that keeps you on edge. Competitively speaking, of course. M many people don't really value that in Trader Town maps, but for me personally, a map that's balanced is a map that requires the innocents to put in a little bit more effort into keeping track of what's going on. It's not just enough to walk into a room, you gotta check angles, you gotta check corners, and Oftentimes, that extra little bit of time spent trying to clear your angles and check for danger is what's required for a trader to get the upper hand. For example, this video clip of me killing so many people with the M249 saw and Mesa Monorail, I wouldn't have been able to pull this off in the original version of Mesa Monorail. I know people dislike this new boxy room, and I don't think it's the most well-designed room, but I do think it definitely improved upon the original Mesa Monorail because before it was just completely open. If I tried to hide hide these bodies the same way I did back then, I would be found out so much easier. But because there's so much clutter and so much stuff going on, it's very hard for these innocents to tell whether I'm the traitor or if there's another traitor nearby, maybe that I'm to be trusted or anything like that. And that level of hesitation is what gives the traders the upper hand. Because you got to remember, there's only one trader per three innocents. And in a full 12 player server, that's three traders versus one detective and 10 innocents. So they need all the help they can get. Yes, C4 kills a lot of people. Yes, Poltergeist kills a lot of people. Yes, J-Bomb kills a lot of people. Even though that's basically a paid game pass where you pay to not play the game. But my point mainly here is that even with all of the tools that traitors are afforded, Detective still has Golden Gun. 
Detective still has radar. Detective still has DNA scanner. And the innocents themselves, if they're played by a smart person, all it takes is one innocent on one of these bad maps to suddenly make the trader's life so much harder. For example, the Nether in Hafen. I... Do I need to explain this to you? Do I, do I need to explain why this is bad? Why this is bad map design? Or, or do you just get my point? As an innocent, you should never get anything for free. You should never have rooms that have only one entrance or exit, because that means that the innocents can hide in the corner of the map and watch the entrance, and whoever the hell comes through the door, well, they must be the traitor, so shoot them. Don't have that, that's cringe. Archipelago literally doesn't have a single room that's just a dead end. Meanwhile, the maps that I don't enjoy playing have multiple rooms that are multiple dead ends, but the most egregious worst examples are rooms that are effectively massive, allowing innocents to just sit miles away from the danger, spot the danger very quickly, and then get to safety, forcing either a round stall or whatever. Hafen is bad for this example because all of it takes is one innocent in Lighthouse to spot everything that is going on in the map at all times. And then you might have an innocent in the nether too. So even if that guy gets sniped early on, well, you know for a fact that the innocent in the nether is going to win the round because he can just wait at any of these random angles and then instantly shoot the traders as soon as they come through. And that's it. I am done with Archipelago. I plan on this being the final update for the entire map and... Honestly, I'll probably do some smaller updates in the future, but for now, this is it. And the main reason why is quite simply, I'm getting too busy for this stuff anymore. <laughs> the reason why I haven't uploaded a proper Trader Town video in years is because these videos take ages to make. Each video that I've made in the past, such as the shotgun video, the karma video, or the camping video, each took about a month to make of just actual work. This map has taken me almost nine months of work. Aggregate total, working days over the past nearly three years. And I think it's time for me to stop. I did the maths and I've spent 269 nice, days working on Archipelago. I'll be moving out of my parents' house soon. In less than a month, I'll have moved out of this tiny town that I've been stuck in for the past 15 years. I don't think I will have the time nor energy to make any more content. Hell, I barely even have any free time left to just sit down, socialize and play a game. These past few months making these videos, I actually haven't really been playing any games. Anytime I do, I feel guilty because I feel like I have these promises to uphold. And so, as soon as I move out, I plan on quitting Trader Town, or more accurately, leaving the community. This means no more videos, no more Discord servers, no more petty dramas that I have to deal with, so now I'll be good. Nothing like that. I'm leaving it all behind, because I've promised so much these past few years, and I've just struggled to deliver on any of it. Some of you may know that I've been working on a map called Vermilion for the past god knows how long, but unfortunately it is a nightmare to make. The map itself is based off of Kyoto, Japan, and when I made Archipelago, I originally made that map at the tail end of COVID. It released Christmas of 2020, meaning I built it during the tail end of the lockdown. I, like everybody else, had spent the last year being cooped up in my house, not being allowed to go outside, and frankly, I got sick of playing video games. <laughs> what I saw as an extended summer holiday to end off my final months at college turned into a boring nightmare and it made me realize what would happen to me if I just spent the rest of my life living in my parents' basement playing video games for the rest of my life. Some of you may know that I live in England and some of those people may also know that I am not from this country. I'm Australian. 100%. Born and blood, raised in Sydney. And the whole time I've just wanted to go back home to Australia at least once. Just on holiday. Just to visit. See my sisters or something like that. Just to see my own country one more time. But honestly, I think that goal is way off for me. But even still, I want to have some independence. And choose where I want to live for the rest of my life. And this isn't exactly a new revelation. I think every single young adult that moves out from their parents has the exact same feelings as me. I'm sure many of you have felt or will feel the same way. I'm leaving the community focus on greener pastures. 
I don't want to feel guilty anymore for not making a map making tutorial video or a parkour video or making vermilion or whatever. I just felt like I didn't have the energy to do any of that anymore. And honestly, I'd rather spend my time working on touching grass. But I felt like making one last video. Just to leave it on a good note. I've enjoyed the ride, and honestly, version 2.3 is an update that frankly, I am incredibly proud of. Next to beating Bloodbath, Archipelago is my magnum opus. These two things are my single greatest achievements. Archipelago took 9 months to make, Bloodbath took 15 months to beat, and together they are testaments to what I can do if I just put my head down, focus on a single thing, and just get it done. Don't expect any more long videos from this channel. If I do make any, it'll be about something completely different. As for you guys, I hope you all have a good life. Be excited for the future. I've got 80 years left to live, and I plan on spending them doing the things I love. Anyways, that's all from me now. I guess I'll be seeing you. And now for my next Ciao. number, I'd like to return to the classics. Kitty cat.